Hi everybody, thanks for coming today. Uh, welcome to uh, another monthly Leaders and Legacies of the Civil War Era program here at Mentor Public Library. Uh, I'm Todd Arrington from down the street at James A. Garfield National Historic Site and um, appreciate you all coming out. Appreciate, uh, I know a lot of you are regulars to these talks and so it's uh, gosh, I think this is about the sixth year we've been doing these and, and the attendance is always so great and everybody asks good questions and, and, uh, and, and I do appreciate everybody continuing to come out. So as long as you guys are interested, we'll keep playing in these. How about that? So, uh, and we're here on the second Wednesday of every month uh, all the way through all 12 months of the year. So there will be another one in June. I think this topic in June is um, the aftermath of battle, uh, medical care and you know burying the dead and this kind of thing. So that one will not be me, but it promises to be a very interesting subject. So I appreciate everybody coming out today. It's a beautiful day outside. We're finally starting to get some of those. Uh, the only downside now is I feel like I need to kind of stay behind the podium so nobody sees how much weight I gained over the winter. <laughs> it was such a long, you know, horrible, drawn out winter and uh, boy, it sure was nice to just go home and sit on the couch every night, but I'm paying for it now. So I'll try to, I'll try to position myself behind the podium for you today. So um, it is May, which means, of course, that the end of the month Memorial Day is coming up. And I thought that uh, we would do something a little different today. I've done something similar to this before. If you were here, I think maybe a year and a half or so ago, I did uh, a program here about the Gettysburg Address, where I kind of really kind of took the address line by line and really kind of talked about, okay, what is Lincoln really trying to get at uh, when he's giving the Gettysburg Address? I'm going to do something similar today. This is a much longer speech, and none of you want to be here until dinner time tonight, I don't think. I may be the best speaker in the world, but you still don't want to sit here for that long. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background about what we called at the time Decoration Day. Uh, and by the end of the program, you know, we'll have a little bit of a sense of sort of when it became known as Memorial Day instead of Decoration Day. But the thing I really want to talk about today is the fact that, uh, if you didn't know, our own James A. Garfield has a very, very prominent role in the history of Decoration Day, now Memorial Day. And that's really what I want to talk about is this... Uh, speech that he gave that we're actually celebrating the 150th anniversary of this month. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then as always, of course, at the end, if you have questions, I'm happy to, to try to answer any questions you might have. So May 30th, 1868 is kind of thought of as the first Decoration Day. And again, I'm going to use Decoration Day as much as I can during this presentation. If I slip and say Memorial Day a few times, just know I'm talking about the same thing. Um, but at the time that James Garfield gave this speech on May 30th, 1868, it was known as Decoration Day. But Decoration Day and Memorial Day are basically the same holiday, although they haven't always been at the same time and all this kind of thing. So before we can really talk about May 30th, 1868, let me just give you a little bit of background about this whole idea of commemorating dead soldiers, soldiers who've been you know, killed in the line of duty. Uh, and of course, obviously, this really started for us here in the United States, primarily during the Civil War, but that's not where this whole idea of decorating the graves of soldiers killed in battle started. It's an, actually kind of an ancient custom. It goes all the way back to the Romans, believe it or not. Uh, so this is not something that, that the United States, you know, that Americans kind of came up with on their own. It is an old custom. Uh, it's been done in many different parts of the world. Uh, and of course, like everything, especially when you're talking about the Civil War, there's no a really good agreement on when did it start, where did it start, who started it. Because of course, both the North and the South want to claim credit <laughs> for, uh, for Decoration Day and, and, and what's now Memorial Day. So uh, in 1906, as you see there on the screen, the, the, uh, the newspaper down in Richmond, the Times-Dispatch, you know, sort of claimed that they started, uh, the Southerners, Virginians, started Decoration Day. Uh, this soldier who was killed in, uh, in, around Warrenton, Virginia, supposedly had his grave, uh, m you know, decorated with flowers uh, in early June of 1861. That may very well be the case. We just don't know 100%. Uh, during the war, we, uh, the United States established a number of national cemeteries. The most famous of those, obviously, is Gettysburg. And so, and in fact, I don't have a pointer here, but I'll, if you've, you've probably seen this photo before, but in case you haven't, this right here is Abraham Lincoln before delivering the Gettysburg Address. This is the only 
known and verified that I'm aware of photo of Lincoln at Gettysburg. There have been a few others lately, really just in the last 10 years or so, that people have found and said that could be Lincoln, we're just not sure. And in this case, it's even hard because he's looks like maybe he's moving a little bit or something. It's kind of hard to say. But anyway, that is Abraham Lincoln there uh, shortly before delivering the Gettysburg Address. And then we have some text over there from the Gettysburg Address. Eh, probably one of the two or three most famous speeches in human history, not just American history. How many of you had to memorize it when you were in elementary school? <laughs> I did. Of course, I grew up in a little town called Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, so you can understand <laughs> why we had to memorize it where I grew up. But at any rate, it's, it's, it's very much an integral part of the history in, in, in that part of the country. So, uh, of course, Lincoln goes to Gettysburg in November of 1863, delivers the Gettysburg Address. Um, you know, he's, he's one of many speakers that day, and um, the, the, the ceremony is dedicating this new, what they call the Soldiers, still technically called the Soldiers National Cemetery. Uh, and it was exactly that. It was a burial ground for Union soldiers killed during the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, I worked at Gettysburg um, many, many moons ago, uh, back in the, the early 90s and uh, had, I'll never forget one lady who got very, very angry with me after a program in Gettysburg National Cemetery about the Gettysburg Address. Because, you know, here we spent two hours together talking about the Gettysburg Address and, and she got very upset because there were no Confederates buried in that cemetery. And uh, I remember her very distinctly being from Louisiana, not Louisiana, Louisiana. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's what she said. And, um, you know, she was very, unhappy and of course I tried to explain to her well you know it's this is established as a union cemetery during the war when the war is still going on now we know there probably are a handful of confederates buried there by mistake because of course a lot of times the, the bodies were so in such degraded uh, decomposed condition that they just couldn't be identified and in fact many well over half of the the soldiers killed in the civil war ended up going uh, being unknown because this is before the era of dog tags and dental analysis and all this stuff like we have today but anyway Gettysburg is probably the most famous of all of the national cemeteries created during the civil war uh, Bowlesburg, also in my home state of Pennsylvania, is another very small town kind of up in the central part of the state, also claims to be the birthplace of Memorial Day uh, for some grave decoration there for uh, soldiers killed fighting for the Union uh, in 1864, again, while the war is still going on. And um, you know, how many of you have heard of Bowlesburg before? Probably not too many. It's not quite as famous as Gettysburg, to say the least. Uh, it's a small town, and I have actually been there, and, uh, you know, nice little town, but uh, they do also um, hold themselves up as the birthplace of Memorial Day as well. Maybe their claim is, is correct. Maybe it's not. We just don't know for sure. This is a really interesting one. This is right when the war ended. So, you know, the war basically ends... Well, really, it doesn't. It's not even technically fully over by May 1st, 1865. Most people tend to think of the Civil War as ending when Lee surrendered to Grant in April of 1865, uh, and that's for the most part correct. Although there, you know, the last Confederates really were still out there in the field until about June or so of 1865. But at any rate, this was Charleston, South Carolina, uh, kind of really the the heart of the Confederacy, because of course, uh, what's in Charleston? Fort Sumter, <laughs> where the whole the whole shooting match began. This was in Charleston in uh, May 1st, 1865, right just a few weeks after the Lee surrendered to Grant. And this is actually a celebration held by African Americans who were uh, holding an observance uh, around some Union graves. Of course, there were plenty of Union soldiers that died in southern states. Uh, and in this case, it was soldiers who had died in, I believe, in a prison, a, a Confederate prison camp. Uh, but at any rate, and there's actually a photo of that, uh, of the events that went on that day. Now, this is sometimes held up as maybe the first really real Memorial Day or Decoration Day celebration. We're just not sure. Um, if you read uh, Race and Reunion by David Blight, excellent book, um, he initially seemed to sort of be leaning toward this being the birthplace of Decoration Day, and now he's kind of backed off a little bit of that in recent years. I think that book was published around 2001, so it's a few years old now. But uh, at any rate, this is an important commemoration, certainly because, you know, it takes on that much more meaning when you see uh, African Americans who, of course, many who had been in, in bondage prior to, uh, prior to the war or really up until just maybe even a few weeks ago when this, uh, when this picture was taken. So at any rate, this is considered an early example of Decoration Day. Not, can't say with any certainty that it was uh, 
definitely the first, but certainly one of the earliest. So you can't really understand the history of, of Decoration Day without talking a little bit about the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. And the Grand Army of the Republic is basically a fraternal organization of, for Union veterans. Um, equivalent today to the American Legion, the VFW, those, those types of things. Uh, this guy here, Gen or, uh, excuse me, Dr. Benjamin Stevenson, who was a, a surgeon in an Illinois infantry regiment for about three years of the war, is credited as being the guy that came up with the idea for the GAR. And it really came out of conversations he had with his tent mate, as you see there on the screen, but also other soldiers, really trying to figure out what was next for them. Uh, you know, once the war was over, everybody knew, obviously, they were living through sort of this defining moment, not only in their own personal lives, but in the life of the country. How were they going to maintain these bonds that, that they had uh, developed with, with fellow soldiers and uh, you know, what were they going to do? And so Stevenson is the guy that's credited with coming up with the idea for what became the Grand Army of the Republic. He was the first commander for a brief time. Uh, and so he's the guy that, that is often thought of as kind of the father of the GAR. So the GAR's guiding principles, fraternity, charity, and loyalty. Fraternity, of course, meaning brotherhood. Uh, charity, meaning helping other veterans, helping other soldiers, uh, and loyalty, remembering and honoring, honoring their loyalty to one another and to the country. The GAR was a, an absolute force in American politics well into the 20th century. The GAR was very adamant that everybody that fought for the Union was on equal standing, black, white, or otherwise. So they did fight very hard for pensions for Civil War veterans. They fought hard for civil rights for, for African American veterans. Uh, and they were very, very quick to um, take offense, we'll say, or take issue with some of the Southern interpretations of the war that became very popular later in the 19th century when the Southerners, Southerners started kind of talking about, oh, it had nothing to do with slavery. It was just a, you know, a, a disagreement about the Constitution. And, you know, we're all friends now. We, are all, we can all agree that we were all brave and we don't really have to think about what the war was really all about. A lot of guys in the GAR said absolutely not. There was a right side and there was a wrong side. And guess what? We were the right side. Not everybody in the GAR felt that way, but a lot of them did. So the GAR is very important to, to uh, consider when you're talking about the history of Decoration Day. So John Logan was a, uh, a very important figure in this story as well. Logan is from Illinois, and he was, a, uh, he was that dreaded political general. So was James Garfield and a lot of other, uh, a lot of other uh, Pretty, pretty successful leaders during the conflict. Logan was from Illinois. He was, he was a politician. Uh, he started his life, his political life as a Democrat, and then later became a Republican. Uh, he served in the House of Representatives for a while, and then when the war started, he joined the Union Army. And you can see the list there. He stayed in the Army really for the duration of the conflict. And you can see the list of the battles there that he fought in. He was wounded at Fort Donaldson, a pretty impressive list. Something interesting about Logan, first Manassas, he wasn't really even part of a regiment. He just kind of showed up and uh, attached himself to a unit, I think from Michigan perhaps, and kind of fought in the battle really as, as unaffili an unaffiliated soldier. Probably couldn't get away with that today, but you know, times were uh, certainly different then. But as you can see, you know, the first Manassas is in July of 1861, the first real large battle of the war, all the way through Nashville, which happens really right at the end of 1864. And then you get into uh, early 1865 and the war ends a few, a few months into 1865. So Logan is very, very important to this story. Uh, and then of course he also goes and serves in the U.S. Senate after of the Civil War and uh, was in the Senate really until he died. He died in 1886, so uh, he was serving as an active senator when he died. Interestingly enough, not really germane to this story, but I'll tell you anyway, is Logan and, and James Garfield knew each other very well. And in fact, Logan was one of the guys that was really pushing for Ulysses S. Grant to be nominated for president again in 1880 when the Republicans eventually selected Garfield. And Logan and Grant and a few other guys did in fact come to Menor and visit Garfield right down the street. So if you want to see where that meeting happened, come see us sometime. But anyway, Logan is, is very important to this story because Logan was the national commander of the GAR for, for quite a long time. 
And Logan is the guy that issued this general order at the beginning of May 1868, setting May 30th, 1868 as what we now think of as Decoration Day. And he issued this order where he said, you know, the, we're going to strew, fl strew flowers on graves and we're going to decorate the graves of our comrades who died in defense of the Union. Uh, in this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades, posts meaning GAR posts, uh, and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. So really this is where the idea of a national decoration day comes from. So when we celebrate Memorial Day here at the end of this month, it really comes out of, of this, uh, this order from John Logan when he was the, uh, the head of the, uh, the GAR. Now, where was this national ceremony going to take place? Again, you see in, in Logan's uh, order there, he's saying, you know, posts across the country can kind of do whatever they want, but you should do something. But there also has to be something on, an, on a national scale. And the place that they decided to do it was Arlington National Cemetery. Now, uh, just a very brief history of Arlington, you probably know, Arlington House, right across, right across the bridge now from Washington, D.C., in Virginia, on Virginia soil, but really right across the river from Washington, was, prior to the war, the home of Robert E. Lee. It was an, uh, the family home of his wife, uh, and it had been left to her, and his wife was uh, descended from like a stepson of, or stepgrandson of, of George Washington. Uh, so this is Arlington House, and it's still there, and it's also run by the National Park Service. So if you ever go there, you'll see somebody dressed like me. Um, and so Lee, of course, you know the story of Robert E. Lee. He's a Virginian. He's you know served 35 years or so in the Army. They offer him command of Union forces at the beginning of the war. He says no, and then resigns to cast his lot with Virginia and eventually with the Confederacy. Uh, and pretty soon after that, Union forces cross into Virginia and they take over this property. So the, the area that is now Arlington National Cemetery, the most, probably the most famous and most revered military cemetery in the whole country, I mean, John F. Kennedy's buried there and, and Thurgood Marshall and, you know, really just this, you know, Robert F. Kennedy, William Howard Taft, all this, this huge litany of, of famous Americans. This is where that property first came into the possession of the federal government during the Civil War when the Lees, of course, abandoned the property, you know, left because they knew Union forces were going to be coming very soon. Union forces take over, take over the, uh, it becomes kind of a, a hospital for a while, uh, and then eventually becomes a cemetery. So that's how this property originally came into the hands of the federal government. The first burial there was in May of 1864. Uh, and they did bury U.S. colored troops there as well. So this uh, property that had once been a slave plantation now had free black men fighting for the Union against the Confederacy buried in its, in its, uh, in its, on its grounds. So because of the fact that it, it was originally Robert E. Lee's home, because of the fact that U.S. colored troops were buried there, it became a very highly regarded place, a very, a very, uh, very revered cemetery. It became hallowed ground. So it was a natural place for a ceremony like this to take place. This is the place today if you go and you'll see, you can see the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and all this kind of thing. Um, so this was the site that was selected for the first National Decoration Day ceremony. And of course, any ceremony like that, you need a, a very good speaker to come and give a, a powerful address. And in this case, they selected James Garfield from Menor, Ohio, the only president of the United States that ever lived in Menor, Ohio, believe it or not. Garfield, of course, in 1868 is still relatively young. He's about, what, 37 or so years old. He's a member of the House of Representatives, has been since, uh, since late 1863. He's a Republican, and, and at the time, we're the 14th Congressional District now. At the time, it was the 19th Congressional District, which is why I have that Ohio 19 up there. Uh, Garfield was, I think, an excellent choice, and I think he certainly uh, rose to the occasion, as he usually did when he was called on to make a speech. Uh, Garfield had all of, checked all the right boxes, I guess you would say. He was very anti-slavery prior to the war. Uh, he did fight in the Union Army. He left behind a, a, you know, a relatively comfortable life. He had a job as a, as a, as a college uh, president, the Western Reserve, Historic, or, um, <laughs> Western Reserve Eclectic Institute. 
Um, he was a state senator in Ohio. He was one of those guys that really didn't have to go fight. Uh, he certainly could have avoided fighting if he didn't want to. Uh, but because his feelings were so strong, he voluntarily went into the Union Army in 1861, helped raise a, a regiment that eventually became the 42nd Ohio. A lot of the soldiers in that regiment were students of his down in Hiram at, at the Eclectic Institute. Um, served uh, for about two and a half years, fought at battles like Middle Creek, uh, showed up really at the very end of the Battle of Shiloh, uh, the Siege of Corinth, uh, Chickamauga is probably the most famous battle at which he was present, uh, where he was the uh, Chief of Staff to the Army of the Cumberland at that point. And Garfield left the Army at the end of 1863 when the war was still going on, of course, to take a seat in Congress. He'd been elected to Congress while he was serving in the Army, and after this kind of internal struggle about, eh, should he stay in the Army or go to Congress, eventually decided that he should, uh, in fact, go to Congress. And that's where he stayed until he was elected president in 1880. So Garfield checks all the boxes, and then on top of everything else, he's really thought of as one of the best speakers in the Republican Party. Had a really kind of deep voice, um, this is the era before, you know, <laughs> microphones and things like that. So he was able to project his voice very well. Even so, obviously, a lot of people probably didn't hear a word he said that day that were there just because they were too far away. But had a great uh, speaking voice uh, and really had a strong command of the English language. He was a scholar and an academic, had great command of, of history. Uh, and, of course, again, had, you know, had a personal connection here because he had fought in the war. He had seen friends killed. He had seen young men die of disease in camps and things like that. So, obviously, this was something that was very personal to him. And I think, you know, John Logan made an excellent choice by selecting Garfield to, uh, to be the, the keynote speaker that day. This is a photo of the speaker's platform at Arlington on May 30th, 1868. You can't... Uh, find Garfield in there anywhere, you know, maybe you could if you had a, 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 a magnifying glass, thank you, but, uh, but, you know, it's just a good photo. You see the in memoriam there, which has some great meaning if you come down the street to the Garfield home, there's a reference to in memoriam as well, and I won't tell you what that is because I'm going to try to convince you to come see us at some point this summer. Uh, but at any rate, this is what the platform looked like on May 30th of 1868. So what I'll do now is I'm going to, I generally don't like to read the text that's on the slides. I think that's kind of boring, but these are powerful words. So I'm going to read what you're seeing up on the, uh, on the, on the slides. And then after each slide, uh, we'll just talk about it for a minute and try to deduce, you know, what is Garfield really saying here? What's he referencing? Um, and again, similar to what we did with the, the Gettysburg Address here about a year and a half or so ago. Um, but I think this, these are powerful words. I think they still have a lot to, to offer us, even though the speech was given 150 years ago. I do not have the full speech in this. I have a lot of it, but not the whole thing, because it is a very lengthy speech. So Garfield begins, this is the very beginning of the speech, I am oppressed with a sense of the impropriety of uttering words on this occasion. If silence is ever golden, it must be here, beside the graves of 15,000 men. There's a lot more than that buried in Arlington now, but at the time it was about 15,000. 15,000 men whose lives were more significant than speech and whose death was a poem, the music of which can never be sung. With words we make promises, plight faith, praise virtue. Promises may not be kept, plighted faith may be broken, and vaunted virtue be only the cunning mask of vice. We do not know one promise these men made, one pledge they gave, one word they spoke, but we do know they summed up and perfected by one supreme act the highest virtues of men and citizens. For love of country, they accepted death and thus resolved all doubts and made immortal their patriotism and their virtue. For the noblest man that lives, there still remains a conflict. He must still withstand the assaults of time and fortune, must still be assailed with temptations before which lofty natures have fallen. But with, these, the con but with these, the conflict ended, the victory was won, when death stamped on them the great seal of heroic character, and closed a record which years can never blot. What high motive led them to condense life into an hour and to crown that hour by joyfully welcoming death? Let us consider. And of course, let us consider is just his way of saying I'm going to keep talking. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, um, you know, I mean, there's obviously some sort of high Victorian language here. And, you know, some of it is probably a little... Um, 
a, a, a little over the top. I don't know if you could really say that these men welcomed death. They probably, no one wanted to die, I'm sure. But I think, obviously, the symbolism, what he's trying to get at is exactly that. They didn't want to die, but they did. They laid down their lives for a greater cause. They laid down their lives for the greater purpose. For love of country, they accepted death. They may not have accepted it, but they faced it. Um, and uh, I think that's really kind of what he's getting at. And I think, you know, if you were to, if Garfield were to walk in here today and we were to ask him some questions about the speech, I think he would say, yes, obviously none of them wanted to die. And that's what makes their death so much more powerful, is that despite the fact that they didn't want to die or be horribly maimed, uh, they would still went into battle uh, because they felt that, that it was the right thing to do. Now here he goes, he harkens back a little bit, you know, we get into a little bit of, uh, of American history here. Eight years ago, this was the most unwarlike nation of the earth. For nearly 50 years, no spot in any of these states had been the scene of battle. 30 millions of people had an army of less than 10,000 men. The faith of our people in the stability and permanence of their institutions was like their faith in the eternal course of nature. Peace, liberty, and personal security were blessings as common and universal as sunshine and showers and fruitful seasons, and all sprang from a single source, the old American principle that all owe due submission and obedience to the lawfully expressed will of the majority. This is not one of the doctrines of our political system. It is the system itself. Against this principle, the whole weight of the rebellion was thrown. So a great sort of hearkening back again to, to American history, talking about, um, I, I love that line about, you know, the old American principle, we all owe due submission and obedience to the lawfully expressed will of the majority. And we call those elections, right? Your candidate doesn't always win, or your party, or, or the issues that you care about don't always come out on top. But we bow to the will of the majority. And that is, not the, that is not a doctrine of the political system. That is the system. And so what's he really saying here? One, again, he's, he's, he's thinking about American history, and that's why I use the, the Constitution there uh, in, the, uh, in the one graphic. Uh, but he's also saying what? The South didn't like the way things were going. They didn't like the fact that the guy they didn't like, Abraham Lincoln, won the election of 1860, and they just said what? Well, then we're out. We give up. We're out. We're leaving. Against this principle, the whole weight of the rebellion was thrown. So it's really a reference to, uh, to not only to history, but also to the way that the South decided, well, this is, didn't go our way, and therefore we're going, to, uh, we're going to leave the Union. The nation was summoned to arms by every high motive which can inspire men. Two centuries of freedom had, ma had made its people unfit for despotism. They must save their gover government or miserably perish. As a flash of lightning in a midnight tempest reveals the abysmal horrors of the sea, so did the flash of the first gun disclose the awful abyss into which the rebellion was ready to plunge us. In a moment, the fire was lighted in 20 million hearts. In a moment, we were the most warlike nation on earth, referencing back to 50 years ago when we were the most unwarlike nation on earth. In a moment, we were not merely a people with an army, we were a people in arms. The nation was in column, not all at the front, but all in the array. So what is he saying here? That the war affected everybody, whether you were in the army or the navy or not, the war affected you. How quickly did we become not just an army, but a nation under arms? Again, the war affected everyone. Even if you were too old to fight or too young to fight, you knew somebody that went. Maybe who was buried there at Arlington or in another national cemetery. Uh, you, knew, you, you, you knew somebody who went. You probably knew somebody who didn't come home. And the war affected every aspect of your life. Maybe you weren't fighting yourself, but there wasn't enough food to eat. You had to, you had to, to you know, ration your supplies, or you had to grow more food on your farm to send to the army. So he's trying to, I think, really talk about the fact that, that, this, that this conflict was affecting every single person in the country, both sides, both sides. I love to believe that no heroic sacrifice is ever lost, that the characters of men are molded and inspired by what their fathers have done, 
that treasured up in American souls are all the unconscious influences of the great deeds of the Anglo-Saxon race, from Agincourt to Bunker Hill. Could these men be silent in 1861? These whose ancestors had felt the inspiration of battle on every field where civilization had fought in the last thousand years, referencing back to the, the Anglo-Saxon race. And that actually is an important uh, thing to, to note, and you'll understand why in a moment. Read their answer in this green turf. Each for him gathered up the cherished purposes of life, its aims and ambitions, its dearest affections, and flung all with life itself into the scale of battle. Again, I think the, the, the reference to the Anglo-Saxon race becomes very important here in a minute, and, and again, I'll, 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 uh, I'll talk about that. There's also this, I think, interesting reference to, um, and, and you, can, you can find this in, in the writings of Abraham Lincoln. You can even find it as far forward as somebody like Theodore Roosevelt. These great men who were concerned that their generation had nothing to offer. Their generation, you know, oh, you know, we'll never be as great as the Founding Fathers. That was Lincoln. We'll never, you know, my generation is, you know, we have no big issues to worry about. Uh, we don't have any opportunity to make our mark in the world. The Founding Fathers will, will never be eclipsed. This coming from Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> uh, a young Abraham Lincoln, obviously. And then a very young Theodore Roosevelt looking back at the men who fought the Civil War and saying, my generation will never be as great as these guys. We have nothing left to offer. We have nothing left to accomplish. No matter what we do, we'll never have the glory that these guys had. And that's part of the reason somebody like Theodore Roosevelt was so eager to go fight in the Spanish-American War. He wanted to prove himself to be up to the challenge that, that these men had faced and a lot had not come back from, as Garfield is talking about. Now here's where the, the reference to the Anglo-Saxon race becomes so interesting. We began the war for the Union alone, but we had not gone far into its darkness before a new element was added to the conflict. The nation was taught that God had linked to our own the destiny of an enslaved race, that their liberty and our Union were indeed one and inseparable. It was this that made the soul of John Brown the marching companion of our soldiers and made them sing as they went down to battle. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom which transfigures you, transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. Anybody know where that's from? Republic. Battle Hymn of the Republic, of course. So here's Garfield acknowledging that slavery obviously had something to do with the war. Regardless of what Southerners were saying, uh, here's Garfield, somebody who fought for the Union, who is making very, very uh, clear links between slavery and the war itself. We had not gone far into its darkness before a new element was added, the, f the destiny of an enslaved race. Now, was Abraham Lincoln an abolitionist at the beginning of the Civil War? No. No, of course not. Lincoln said what? He wanted, his job was to save the Union. But how quickly did Lincoln come around to the idea that he could not save the Union and re reunite the country with slavery still in existence? It just couldn't happen. Now, interestingly enough, and you've probably heard me refer to this in, in, in other programs, on April 14, 1861, two days after Fort Sumter, two days after Fort Sumter, when everybody is all up in arms about Fort Sumter, and men on both sides are rushing to enlistment stations to join up and fight what everybody at the time thought would be a short, maybe one battle, and, and then it would, be, uh, uh, it would all be settled. James Garfield, at, at that point, two days after Fort Sumter, writes a letter, and I don't have it quoted here, where he says, I believe the war will soon assume the shape of slavery and freedom. The world will so understand it, and I believe the outcome will redound to the good of humanity. So two days after Fort Sumter, young James Garfield already knows what it's really all about. And now here he is seven years later as a congressman, as a veteran, making that link again, that slavery was obviously really the root cause of the war. Yeah, there's other things, states' rights and economics and all this stuff. That stuff can really all be looped in with, uh, with slavery. So here's Garfield reminding everyone what the war was really all about. This is a long one, I apologize. <laughs> and now consider this silent assembly of the dead. What does it represent? Nay, you don't hear anybody say nay very much anymore. Nay, rather, what does it not represent? It is the epitome, it is an epitome of the war. Here are sheaves reaped in the harvest of death from every battlefield in Virginia. 
If each grave had a voice to tell us what its silent tenant last saw and heard on earth, we might stand with uncovered heads and hear the whole story of the war. We should hear that one perished when the first great drops of the crimson shower began to fall, when the darkness of that first disaster at Manassas fell like an eclipse on the nation, that another died of disease while wearily waiting for winter to end, that this one fell on the field in sight of the spires of Richmond, little dreaming that the flag must be carried through three more years of blood before it should be planted in that citadel of treason. Now there's a powerful... <laughs> You know, not much wiggle room there, no nuance there, really. Richmond is a citadel of treason. And that one fell while the tide of war had swept us back till the roar of rebel guns shook the dome of yonder capital. Remember, they're in Arlington, right across the river from Washington. So when he talks about the capital, literally he's talking about the capital building, and which is why it's spelled with an O here. There's references to the capital with an A, that's the capital city as well. Uh, shook the dome of yonder capital and re-echoed in the chambers of the executive mansion. We should hear mingled voices from the Rappahannock, the Rapidan, the Chickahominy, and the James, solemn voices from the wilderness, and triumphant shouts from the Shenandoah, from Petersburg, and the Five Forks, mingled with the wild acclaim of victory and the sweet chorus of returning peace. The voices of these dead will forever fill the land like holy benedictions. What other spot so fitting for their last resting place as this under the shadow of the capital saved by their valor? Here where the grim edge of battle joined, here where all the hope and fear and agony of their country centered, here let them rest asleep on the nation's heart entombed in the nation's love. So this really I think references their, the location where they were standing on May 30th, 1868. They're in Arlington, they're in Virginia, and yet they're just across the river from the, from the Capitol. And they can see the Capitol City and probably even the Capitol building at that point. Something I find interesting about this quote, all of these battles that he mentions. Uh, let's see, Manassas, Richmond, the Rappahannock, the Rapid, and the Chickahominy, the James, those are rivers, obviously. Solemn voices from the wilderness. Shouts from the Shenandoah, Petersburg, Five Forks. What's interesting about all those battles? Well, first of all, they're all in Virginia, right? Most of them are in Virginia, which is where they are. But they're all in the Eastern Theater of the War. Where did Garfield fight? The West. Where did Garfield fight? He fought in the West. And when you think about really the most influential Union generals, unfortunately Garfield's not one of them, I admit that, uh, but the most influential Union generals that ended up really bringing the South uh, finally to, to, uh, to defeat, who are they? Grant, yep. Sherman, yep. Sheridan, guys like that, George Thomas maybe? What's significant about all those guys? They all fought in the West. Yep. They all fought in the West. Now, hey, I told you where I grew up. It's sacrilege to go to Gettysburg and say, yeah, Gettysburg's important, but you know, Vicksburg's way more important. <laughs> the Western theater is where, where, where really the war was won. Um, and, and that's probably not exactly correct. The Western Theater isn't where it was won, but I think it was really the proving ground for the guys that won the war. So as much as it pains me to say it, the Western Theater really, to me, is probably as vital or more than the Eastern Theater. Garfield fights in the West. He doesn't fight in any of these battles. Now, maybe he's just sort of tipping his cap to the fact that they're in Virginia or they're, in the, they're on the East Coast rather than, than in the West. But I do find it interesting that of all the battles he mentions, they're all Eastern theater battles. I, I don't know if it means anything. Maybe he just, you know, may, maybe they were just, uh, may, or maybe, you know, now that I think about it, maybe most of the soldiers buried there were killed in Eastern theater battles. They probably weren't killed in Western theater battles. That's probably it now that I think about it. Well, okay, I answered my own question. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> It's good that I still have questions, I guess. Now, here's, here's another one of my favorite passages. Seven years ago, this, meaning Arlington, this was the home of one who lifted his sword against the life of his country and who became the great imper imperator of the rebellion. The soil beneath our feet was watered by the tears of slaves, in whose hearts the sight of yonder proud capital awakened no pride and inspired no hope. The face of the, of the goddess that crowns it was turned towards the sea and not towards them. But thanks be to God, this arena of rebellion and slavery is a scene of violence and crime no longer. This will be forever the sacred mountain of our capital. 
Hither our children's children shall come to pay their tribute of grateful homage. For this we are met today. Thousands of soldiers are today turning aside in the march of life to visit the silent encampments of dead comrades who once fought by their side. Who is the one who lifted his sword against the life of his country? It's Robert E. Lee, right? Again, not a lot of nuance with Garfield here. I like that. He's direct. He doesn't say Robert E. Lee, but you, all, you know who he's talking about. So he's referencing Lee. He references the fact that you know the, the, uh, this was a, a land that was worked by slaves, and, and the soil beneath our feet was watered by the tears of slaves. And you know, here's, this is a very famous photo. This is not one of Lee's slaves. I'm not saying that. But very famous photo of a slave showing off the, you know, the, the scars on his back from the lashes he'd received. And then, of course, that's a, a, a circa 1863 or so image of the, uh, the Capitol building there on the far right as well. So I like, again, that Garfield is, is talking about the, the significance of the ground that they're standing on. And again, it is significant in that it is the home of probably the most, you know, certainly the most famous soldier of the Confederacy and arguably one of the most famous soldiers in all of American history, Robert E. Lee. Uh, so I like the fact that he's referencing where they are and I like the fact uh, that he again is referencing slavery, uh, watered by the tears of slave. And, and, and he's admitting that the government failed them for a very long time, right? He's admitting that. Uh, the soil, uh, the face of the goddess that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the sight of yonder proud capital awakened no pride and inspired no hope to slaves. The face of the goddess that crowns it was turned towards the sea and not towards them. So he's basically, you know, making an allusion to the fact that the government had really kind of turned its back on slaves for really since the beginning of the Republic. And of course, because he fought for the Union, because he, he acknowledged what the war was really all about. The, the implication here is what? That that wrong has been righted. And of course, we all know that it didn't turn out that way, but at least in 1868, Garfield had a reason to believe that the wrong had been righted. For many thousand homes whose light was put out when a soldier fell, there go forth today to join the solemn, these solemn processions, loving kindred and friends, from whose hearts the shadow of grief will never be lifted till the light of the eternal world dawns upon them. And here are children, little children, to whom the war left no father but the father above. By the most sacred rites, theirs is the chief place today. They come with garlands to crown their victorious fathers. I will delay the coronation no longer. And that's the conclusion of the speech. I really like this line uh, you know, where he talks about children. By, their, by the most sacred rites, theirs is the chief place today. An allusion to what? The war was about the future. What kind of country were we going to be? What kind of country were we going to leave our children and our children's children and our children's children's children and on down the line? That's really what it was about. What kind of country did we want to be, not just today, but 100 years hence, 200 years, 300 years, and however long down the line you want to go? So I really like the, the, uh, the, the mentioning of, of, of children there. So that's the end of the speech. Uh, again, just I have some, some images here of decoration days and things like that. So Garfield gives this wonderful speech. It's very well received. I think it's one of his most powerful speeches. When you, you know, the first time you read it, you, and I have a copy of it here if anybody wants to take a look after. Um, you know, it's, there's some flowery language in there and things like that. You know, he's very much a, a, a man of his times. And yet, when you start to really dig, just, to, just peel off one layer. You don't even have to go that deep. Just peel off one layer and start thinking about, what's he really talking about? And that's the same thing we did here about a year and a half ago when we talked about the Gettysburg Address. You know, the words are one thing, but what do the, what do the words mean? I think this becomes, to me at least, one of Garfield's really most powerful speeches. And uh, again, it's the 150th anniversary of this speech this month. So. So just uh, a few graphics here of Decoration Days. Decoration Days then, you know, did become a regular occurrence. Uh, it was always on May 30th for many, many years. And it really did, for a while at least, be, it was almost, it's not the right word to use, but I'll use it anyway. It was almost like a partisan event in that Northerners, in their speeches on Decoration Days, talked a lot about the South was wrong and here's why. We were right. These men that we're honoring today who died in this conflict died for a noble cause, preserving the Union, freeing slaves. So that was, the, that was for, for, for quite a while, that was sort of the style of Decoration Days. 
Now, there is, and I believe they even still celebrate it in some places, in fact, there was a Confederate Memorial Day, and again, I think there still is in some places, and that has come under a lot of controversy lately. If you're following at all what's going on with Confederate monuments, and I'm not certainly going to get into all that, that's a whole nother program sometime. <laughs> And I would prefer to wait years until that is all settled and maybe the, uh, everyone is uh, happy with the way things have gone. But um, Confederate Memorial Day did come about. Um, and a lot of times it was the same idea, honoring Confederate soldiers that fell. Um, but because it became something of a partisan event, if you will, on the, on the Union side, as you can imagine, it did on the Confederate side as well. And if you know anything about have you ever heard that, that, that uh, it's kind of a cliche, but it's kind of true too, you know, the South lost the war but won the peace? A lot of that comes out of this era where Southerners really start trying to convince themselves and, and succeed very well, not only in convincing themselves but convincing others, it had nothing to do with slavery. It was a constitutional disagreement. Um, we all did what we thought was right. We were all honorable. We were all noble. We were all brave. It doesn't really matter what, what the, uh, the fight was, was really all about. Um, so you see some of this Confederate flag imagery here, and, and those come out of some of the Confederate decoration days. And again, I believe that is even still celebrated, at least in some parts of the South. Here's a, uh, an image of an African-American veteran, uh, you know, a, a sort of idealized image of an African-American veteran uh, showing young children the graves of some U.S. colored troops. Again, uh, you know, gosh, how many, about 200, almost 200,000 African-Americans that fought for the Union. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Civil War. <clears throat> and then a few more images here of uh, uh, you know, great African-American leaders, and then there's a, that Harper's Weekly co uh, cover down there showing uh, African-Americans going to vote, because again, this was one of the outcomes of the Civil War, right? And those Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution, abolishing slavery, granting African-American citizenship, giving them suffrage, these are the most basic rights that, that everybody enjoys, right? Now, yes, but at the time, no. And so this is a, a powerful reminder of one of the, uh, the results of the war. Um, but as time went by and the Southerners did begin to kind of, for lack of a better term, win the peace and began to convince people, some, some even in the North, that slavery really wasn't the root cause of the war and that it really didn't matter what it was all about, that let's just remember how, you know, how brave we all were and, and, and there was valor on both sides and all this stuff, black people started to kind of be written out of the narrative. They kind of started to be pushed aside and people started to forget that emancipation of slaves, abolishing slavery, was one of really, was really the true legacy of the war. So as, as those views became more and more popular, guys like this kind of got written out of the picture. So I, and I love this, this picture of these, um, these US colored troops. I love this guy. He looks like he's ready to throw down, doesn't he? He just, he looks angry, and can you blame him? I mean, I think that is such a powerful image. This guy, it's a great image, but this guy especially to me, is, it's a very powerful image. He looks mad and who can blame him. Um, so these are US colored troops. This image is from taken right down the street. Uh, this is the Garfield home in the background. This is a group of African American Civil War veterans that came to Menor during the 1880 front porch presidential campaign and visited James Garfield at his home. Uh, I dare say some of those guys in that crowd in that photo probably knew about and were very familiar with this speech. Uh, and there was a no, there was so you know Garfield got a lot of visits like this during the 1880 campaign. Uh, in this case, it's African American Civil War veterans. There was another case in um, uh, during the campaign where he got a visit from the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Uh, Fisk University is a historically black college in uh, Tennessee and the Fisk Jubilee Singers were this group that was put together to really go around and sing these what they called at the time Negro spirituals um, and the, the Fisk Singers still exist. They're, you know, Fisk is still there and the singers still exist <clears throat> and they go all over the world now and, and, and sing. They visited Garfield uh, about five or six weeks before the 1880 election 
and they sang for him and he and his wife invited them into the home and supposedly according to his personal secretary it was during that period when they were all in the parlor together uh, as they talked about the election coming up Garfield made the statement to the Fisk singers I would rather be with you and defeated than against you and victorious and that had to mean a lot to them and it certainly meant a lot to them that Garfield had given a speech like this even though at that point it was 12 years in the past it certainly meant a lot to them that he had been a very, very vocal uh, advocate for civil rights. He had been a radical Republican during Reconstruction. Uh, Garfield, we're very lucky down the street because he was on the right side of a lot of these post-Civil War issues. Um, not everybody was, obviously, and um, I can't imagine what it's like to go over to work every day and have to talk about Andrew Johnson, <laughs> uh, you know, because I have Park Service colleagues at Andrew Johnson National Historic Site in Tennessee. That's got to be a tough job, try to find something redeeming about Andrew Johnson. Um, it's not so hard with Garfield. We have quite a bit, and uh, this is one of those cases. So bringing it all forward, this is a quote from uh, July 4th, 1913. This is President Woodrow Wilson who was, what, about four years old or five years old when the Civil War began. And July of 1913 was the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And Wilson uh, went to Gettysburg and addressed the veterans of both the Union and the Confederacy. Of course, they had all come together. And you've probably seen you know, photos of the guys you know, shaking hands over the wall at Pickett's Charge and all this kind of stuff. So this just kind of goes to show you how different things were 50 years after the war than they were right when the war ended, including in 1868 when Garfield gave this speech. So here's Wilson, uh, who was a southerner, by the way, born in Virginia and raised uh, uh, in Georgia part of his life. 50 years have gone by s since then, and I crave the privilege of speaking to you for a few minutes of what those 50 years have meant. So here's the President of the United States is going to tell us what the Civil War really meant. What was it all about? What have they meant? They have meant peace and union, and vigor, and the maturity and might of a great nation. How wholesome and healing the peace has been. We have found one another again as brothers and comrades in arms, enemies no longer, generous friends rather, our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten. Except that we shall not forget the splendid valor, the manly devotion of the men then arrayed against one another, now grasping hands and smiling into each other's eyes. But do we deem the nation complete and finished? These venerable men crowd, crowding here to this famous field have set us a great example of devotion and utter sacrifice. They were willing to die that the people might live. But their task is done. Their day is turned into evening. They look to us to perfect what they established. Their work is handed on to us to be done in another way, but not in another spirit. Our day is not over. It is upon us in full tide. So what do we have here? Do you think uh, any U.S. colored troops, of course there were no U.S. colored troops at Gettysburg, I realize, but do you think any U veterans of the U.S. colored troops would have taken issue with anything that Wilson had to say here? Um, that the last 50 years have meant peace and union and vigor. How wholesome and healing the peace has been. How do you think African Americans would have felt about that? African Americans who supposedly were freed because of the Civil War, who supposedly had full and equal protection under the law, full and equal civil rights, guaranteed to them by the Constitution. Do you think they would have agreed with everything Wilson had to say? I'm not sure there was much in here they would have agreed with. But my favorite line in here is the quarrel forgotten. Is, doesn't that just epitomize how different the perspective was? And I'm not necessarily even give, trying to give Wilson a hard time. He's a man of his times too. Um, but doesn't that just kind of epitomize really how the perspective from say 1868 to 1913 had changed. Is that maybe why we still have some of the issues that we have even today? Sure, sure. History has much to teach us, folks. It has much to teach us. If only we would pay attention sometimes. Uh, so Memorial Day, just, just to wrap it up, uh, we now call this holiday Memorial Day. It was originally Decoration Day. We now call it Memorial Day. That term Memorial Day was first used roughly 1882 or so. 
Um, and it became more and more commonly used over the years, but really it, it didn't officially become Memorial Day until much later, um, you know, roughly World War II or so time frame. Um, there was for a period there, you know, it was always May 30th for a while, then they kind of moved it to the last Monday in May and people got confused. They went back to the 30th, now it's the last Monday in May again. So, um, you know, they've, it's still being, <laughs> it's still an imperfect system, I guess. Uh, this photo here on the left, the larger one is from Arlington. Uh, and then the one on the right there is the Soldiers National Cemetery at Gettysburg. So, Now, I do have to put in a shameless plug um, because that's part of my job. Um, so Memorial Day weekend is the 26th, 27th, and then Memorial Day itself is the 28th this year. So on uh, May 26th at 1 o'clock, we are hosting what I think is going to be a fantastic program by this guy on the right here. His name's uh, Dr. Brian Jordan. He is uh, a native of Akron, actually. He's, an, uh, he's a Northeast Ohioan, uh, has a PhD in history from Yale, pretty good school, um, and now teaches at a college down in, in Texas. But he wrote this book called Marching Home, Union Veterans and Their Unending Civil War, and it was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, pretty pretty uh, well-received book, to say the least. And uh, he will be down the street at James A. Garfield on uh, May 26th at 1 o'clock. The program itself is free. If you, you know, we'll be selling the book. If you want to buy the book, he's happy to sign books for people. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think it's going to be a really, really fascinating talk. And it's a great way to get Memorial Day weekend started. I know we sometimes tend to uh, think of Memorial Day as, hey, it's a day off of work, go to a ball game, go to a barbecue, and that stuff's all great. But I think it's important to at least at some point that weekend remember what the, uh, what the event is really all about. And this book is really, really fascinating. And it basically kind of shatters this idea that Union veterans kind of folded up their flags and went home and just went on with their lives. I mean, he talks about guys who, you know, suffered through, through probably what we would think of today as PTSD and alcoholism and just all this stuff, you know, really that this event really really affected people's lives in, in a very negative way. Not saying that the res end result of the war wasn't what needed to happen, I think it was, but just talking about how the war really affected some of the, uh, the guys who fought it, on the Union side at least. So anyway, if you're interested in that, that's uh, Memorial Day weekend, that Saturday Memorial Day weekend, I think it's gonna be fantastic. And you know, we've had a lot of great authors come to, uh, to mentor, but um, I do not think we've had a Pulitzer Prize nominee yet. So this will be a first for us. So I'm excited for that too.